I had a conversation one time with Chris Kyle, the American sniper, and he killed like 150 something people with a sniper rifle. Man, that's, a lot. that's pretty good. Some of the Ranger battalions are tier one because they support some of the other spec ops units. So there's different levels. So tier one, tier two, tier three, right? Delta is tier one. It's always considered, um, it always has its war footing. It's always considered in a state of war because they're always running ops, things like that, of different levels, okay? Um, a nuclear-powered a nuclear powered submarine is a tier one asset. Certain airplanes are tier one assets, right? And then you have tier two. Uh, what would be a tier two asset? Um, Green Berets, uh, Navy SEALs. I call them vanilla SEALs, right? Not, not SEAL Team 6. Um, they would be considered black. They're, they would be tier one. But the other uh, vanilla teams that are not special operations, if you will, um, are considered tier two. Uh, Rangers, some of the Ranger battalions are tier one because they support some of the other spec ops units. So there's different levels. So tier one, tier two, tier three, right? Um, and because I was in that organization, we're in a constant state of war. So we're doing operations all the time. May not always be war fighting, but it's something related to that space. Um, and the other thing that, you know, operator, what is a Delta Force operator, right? Now everybody's hijacked the word operator. Um, what does operator actually mean? Well, if you're a Delta Force operator, you're not always operating as a soldier. Sometimes you're operating um, under the guise or auspices of another government agency, right? Your badge credential through them, and or you might actually be out working as a civilian, right? And so when it comes down to your evaluation reports, when they're trying to compare you to your peer group, say in special forces, all right, how do they distinguish your mission from what they do, right? And so there it is, right? If I'm, if I'm doing all kinds of, you know, you're just doing your MOS-related job, but I'm over here doing stuff like, you know, whatever, you know, in, in a suit one day and, you know, tennis shorts the next day and the other day in a military uniform, you know, um, how do you, how do you quantify and qualify that, right? You know, so there was, that was an issue for a long time is like, how do we promote our guys that don't exist, you know, and they do all this other special stuff. Um, so they're, you know, they, they sort of, they've worked through all that at this point, but now, you know, Every swinging dick thinks he's an operator. You know, you got, I'm a ranger operator. I'm a SEAL operator. I'm a police operator. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. You know, it, it sounds cool. Everybody wants to be an operator, but you know what? You want to be an operator? Go earn it. Take the long walk is what I always say. You know, if you're a SEAL, you're a SEAL. If you're a Green Beret, you're a Green Beret. If you're a ranger, you're a ranger. You're a Marine, you're a Marine. You know, you're a cop, you're a cop. You're SWAT, you're SWAT. You know, that's it. Just be happy with what you are, man. Stop, you know, stop trying to be more than what you are. Just, you know, it, the name doesn't mean nothing. Right. It's the job, right? right. Just be proud of what you've done. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's looking down on you. You know, if you want to be something better, more elite, then go for it. Go work, work for it. You know, go earn it. Don't just uh, freaking hijack a name, you know? Right. But it's, again, it's the human condition, right? We just, humans are weird. Yeah. So when you get in now, what, where, do you remember your first mission? Actually, my first mission was in 82nd Grenada, 1983. Yeah. Oh, wait, is this... What movie was that story? To? Oh, Clint Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street, where he's like, "You ever hear of Grenada?" Oh, yeah. And, and he's like, "No." And he said, "It's basically this country we went in. We, we said we could wipe you off the fucking map. You're Grenada right now." He's pointing at Jordan Belfort yeah. when they got him. When they got him to a T. So what? What was? Can you just explain the background there and what was yeah. happening? So again, Cubans, right? So the Cubans were in Grenada, <laughs> you know. And and anyways, political reasons. I love how you said again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's communism, right? It's trying to it's trying to spread. And so he's in Grenada. And the decision was made that we've got to liberate Grenada from the Cubans, right? The communist Cubans. And I was in the 82nd Airborne Division at the time. And what we did was, you know, you have the island of Grenada, which is not very big. And then you got surrounding smaller islands. Um, and, and so what we needed to do is do reconnaissance on the smaller islands, set up what we call OPs, um, observation positions, observation posts, where we're looking for, listening for, or waiting for Cubans and PRA, which is um, People's Republic of uh, Grenada, PRG, I believe it's called. It's been a while. Prague, I think is what it's called. Anyways, Grenadian uh, militia that was sympathetic to the Cubans. Um, they had cached a lot of weapon systems on these islands, and what they were doing is going out at night on boats and recovering them. You know, and guerrilla warfare is what it was. And what we did is we occupied these small islands, waited for them to come, and then we'd either call for help or we just go ahead and engage them um, as they um, as they came to the islands. In fact, uh, two of the most decorated soldiers out of Grenada came out of my platoon, out of my lure platoon, um, for combat. So um, heroism, all kinds of stuff. But uh, 
interesting story about that. I was actually in school. I was in, in a school called Ricondo School. So I happened to be in Ricondo School at the time and uh, on Fort Bragg. And I remember one morning, we heard all these airplanes flying around above. It's like, what's going on? We got all these fast movers up there. You know, something was buzzing and something was going on. And and then they had, you know, the, the uh, cadre pulls together, had a formation. They go, if you hear your name, call, report back to unit. So they started naming all these names and like, what is going on here? And by the time I got back to the unit, my unit had already left. They were already in Grenada, right? And I was like, damn, so I got left behind. And so I'm like, oh, how do I get how do I get there to be part of this, you know, mm. the fun, right? So I managed to get on another logistics flight and escort a bunch of batteries and logistics and radios and stuff on a C-141, fly into Grenada. So I show up uh, late in the afternoon, almost dark, uh, you know, dusk, when I show up. And we land, and the problem was the airplanes, once they land, they got to take back off because, there's, you know, they could get bombed and blown up and targeted on the, on the runway. So it was still hot. So we land, we unload all this crap, you know, and I'm sitting on this pallet with all these batteries and stuff, and I'm expecting somebody from my platoon to be there to pick me up with a truck and haul this stuff off because they knew I was coming, or so I thought. And so nobody shows up, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and there's two guys on the drop, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, on the airstrip, Air Force uh, Safety Officer, ASO, I believe he was called, and uh, Commander. And they're like, hey, Sarge, or specialist, I was a spec four at the time. Hey, spec four, um, you can't stay here. You got to leave. And I'm like, yeah, where am I supposed to go? Nobody's here to pick me up, you know? And, well, you can't stay here. And I'm like, I got all these batteries. You can't stay here. Mm. I couldn't believe I had this argument with these guys. And I'm like, dude, where am I supposed to go if I can't stay here, right? And uh, they're like, well, I don't know, but you can't stay here. <laughs> And pretty much made it clear. It's like, you got to leave. And I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know. You know, this is Grenada. <laughs> There's Cubans running around in PRA and you know, fighting and stuff. And I don't know where my platoon's at, you know? And uh, yeah, that, this actually happened. So I'm like, okay, so you're telling me I got to go. Yeah. I said, can I have some ammunition? So he gave me some magazines. I loaded up. And I literally walked off that night into the, off into the, uh, into the jungle, walking through Grenada. I'm walking for several hours. I end up downtown. You're walking into the jungle. I'm walking by myself in Grenada, right? Huh. And so literally by myself. And I end up in uh, Georgetown, the capital. And right before I enter, you know, there's a lot going on there. I'm like, I don't know if I want to walk in there by myself, you know, with, you know, and hey, anybody know where the Lurper Tunes at? <laughs> I said, that's probably a bad <laughs> idea, right? So, so I turn around and I'm walking all night and I'm walking down this dirt road. It's dark, you know, it's spooky. And I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just walking, meandering around the, ju the jungle, right? And uh, all of a sudden I hear, halt, who goes there? And right away I recognize the voice, a guy named Sean. He was on my team. I go, Sean? Sergeant Copstock? You know, like, hey, hey, hey. we're like hugging it tonight, you know, hey, hey, you know. <laughs> so that's how I linked up with my platoon. But uh, yeah, I just, I, when I look back at it, I was like, you can't make that shit up. I'm literally walking around Grenada. Don't know where I'm going, looking for my platoon because a couple of officers just kicked me off the freaking airfield because they said I can't stay there. They didn't give me any reason why, I just said I can't stay there. I'm like, okay, give me some ammo. I'm gonna leave. <laughs> That's uh, insane. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Grenada was interesting, but uh, you know, that was my first uh my first combat deployment. Um, kind of uneventful for me. We were mostly doing Uneventful, just yeah, just walking Bramble around. through the jungle yeah. and fucking Grenada looking yeah. for life. Yeah, dodging <laughs> Cubans. <laughs> how many, how many Cubans. How many Cubans took a header yeah. on that walk? No, nine, man. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was actually my first experience. I've, I've actually, I've been in every campaign, literally every campaign from Grenada, Panama, Somalia, um, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, Afghanistan, Yemen, and a few things in between that you know are not uh, not public. But uh, um, the last time I've seen combat was year 2015, 2016, so not that long ago. Um, I've always been a combatant. Um, I've always I've always engaged the enemy at close proximity. That was my job um, to go out and find, fix, fight, and finish the enemy, whether it was with with weapon systems, explosives, mortars. I was pretty good with mortars, too. Um, I had a conversation one time with Chris Kyle, the American sniper, and he killed like 150-something people with a sniper rifle. Man, that's, a lot. that's pretty good. 